من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته الخائلون ولا يحسين ماءه العادون ولا يعد حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الحمم ولا يناله غوث الفتن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نقد موجود ولا وقت معدود ولا اجل ممدود فترى القلائق بقدرته ونشر الرياح برحمته اللهم افس صله سلواتك وسلامه تسليماتك على عظل التعينات المفاضه من الاماء رباني وآخر التنزلات المزافة على نوع الإنسان كان الله ولم يكن ماءه شيء ثاني محسي لعوالم حضرات الخامس في وجوده وكل شيء نحسيناه في إمام المبين الرسول النبي المكي المدني القرشي التحامي صاحب لواء الحمد ومقام المحمود عبد القاسم محمد الحميد اللهم صل على وعلى اقيه وسهره وابن عمه وخليفته من بعده وقائد الغر المحجلين يا سب الدين امام المتقين امير المؤمنين علي ابن ابي طالب اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ابنته الطاهره الحوراء العنسيه الراضيه المرضيه الشفيه يوم الجزاء فاطمه الزهراء سلام الله عليها اللهم صل على محمد وعلى سبتي رحمة وسيدي شباب أهل الجنة الحسن والحسين اللهم صل على عمة المسلمين علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجافر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد وحسن بن علي وحجة القائم المنتظر المحدي اللهم صل على محمد حججك على عبادك وعمنائك في بلادك اللهم سحل من حجهم وعجل في فرجهم وجعلنا من محبيهم ومواليهم وشيئتهم ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يومنا هذا إلى قيام يوم الدين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وجعلنا منهم أئمة يحدون بعمرنا لما ثبروا وكانوا بآياتنا يوقنون صدق الله العلي العظيم سلوات I begin in the name of Allah, the most beneficent and most merciful. It's a great tawfiq for all of us to commemorate the Arba'een of Imam Hussain and the martyrs of Karbala and to specially reflect in the light of that sacrifice our own actions and knowing where we stand as those who call upon the Imam saying, Oh Imam, we wished we were with you. Ya laytani kuntu ma'akum. And since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a special mercy during these days, so the inspiration and tawfiq is going to be exponential if we seek from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during these nights. When we ask Allah on behalf of the martyrdom of Imam Hussain and his Ahlul Bayt, 
The verse of Holy Quran I had the honor of reciting is the verse of Surah Sajda, verse 24, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَحْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا And amongst them we appointed imams to guide the people by our command. لَمَّا سَبَرُوا وَكَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يُقِنُونَ when they had been patient and had conviction in our signs. The topic of discussion, my dear brothers and sisters, is the appointment or the divine appointment of guidance has not been left by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hands of people, but rather Allah had kept that to himself that he would be the one who is going to appoint those guides who are going to be the imams on for from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a'imma here is the plural of imam. So Allah is saying that we are the one who appoint imams. And what is the characteristic of these imams? How are they coming into this world? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they come so that they could guide, but they do not guide on their own. Yahduna bi amrena. They guide through our command. They guide through our endorsement and the amr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Imam, when he comes, he is not uh, helpless. When he comes to this world, he is not seeking anybody's help because he has the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with him. Those who come in the fold of Islam through the guidance of the Imam are the ones who are being helped by the Imam. Not the Imam needs their help. Imam has come with a divine duty for whose protection Allah took upon himself the responsibility of protecting that Imam. And making sure that the guidance that is given to people is through that divine grace, but through the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my dear brothers and sisters, one of the most fundamental questions that uh, I wanted to raise and remind ourselves is that imams are not appointed by people. Imams are appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The appointment is divine. Nobody, no ummah has a right to appoint their own imam. If the duty of the imam is to guide people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the creator himself takes that uh, uh, responsibility upon him to appoint the imam. So this notion of trying to flow with the flow in our current times, we sort of tend to... Uh, make others feel that we are also champions of democracy uh, and we are also in line uh, with the democratic values, uh, we come forward and we try to portray that see if there is democracy in Islam and there is you know uh, shura in Islam and the appointment, this is how the Islamic state was run. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says directly in Quran that the guides that are going to be coming from Allah to take humanity towards Allah would be appointed by Allah himself. And now if, if that guide himself delegates that task to somebody else, that delegating that task is also a divine appointment. Why? Because the one who is appointing himself has been appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we find that this notion that no, when the Prophet of Allah passed away, the Ummah had the right to choose their own leader is neutralized in the light of the verses of Holy Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we are the ones who appoint the Imams and we are the ones who's, through whose command they guide people. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the quality of how these imams are. Lamma sabaru wa kanu bi ayatina yukhinun. When they had been patient and had convictions in our signs. So one, the signs of the imams are that the imams are patient 
and their belief and their convictions are unshattering. Doubt can never crept or doubt can never creep into their faith ever. Because Allah is guaranteeing their Iman. They have uh, unwavering conviction in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Imam that comes from Allah can never have a doubt. A doubtful Imam, somebody who doubts, cannot be an Imam. Somebody who is very, very hasty in making decisions cannot be an Imam. Why? Because Allah says that the Imams that we send, their quality is that they are patient. Please recite a salawat. Allah Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Now I would like to share a hadith uh, from our sixth Imam, Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam. The Imam says, Inna dunya la takunu illa wa fiha imaman. This world would not exist but with two Imams. Barrun wa fajirun. There is one Imam for goodness or good virtues and there is one Imam for bad. Allazi Allah and then the Imam cites the verse of Holy Quran, the, Quran, the verse that I had the honor of reciting. Um, the same verse that I had begun my speech. That is the verse that the Imam recites and says, which says that we are the ones, Allah says, we are the ones who appoint the Imams and they guide people through our command. Ammal Fajr, then the Imam says, how about those who are transgressors? There are Imams of transgression, there are Imams of sin. Khal Allah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another verse of Holy Quran, وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَدْعُونَ إِلَى النَّارِ وَيَوْمَ الْخِيَامَ لَا يُنْسَرُونَ And they are the Imams who have been also appointed, who invite people towards fire. And on the day of judgment, they will not have any helper. This is also a verse of Holy Quran. So what Quran is saying that there are Imams who are divinely guided, who guide people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then there are Imams who are going to invite people towards the fire, towards the fire of hell. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the words of Holy Quran that on the day of judgment these Imams nor those were, who were the followers would have any help on the day of judgment. So my dear brothers and sisters, this also concludes that there are Imams who guide towards Allah and there are Imams who can guide towards the fire of hell. Now it is our choice to ensure that we hold on to the Imams who have been guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who have that amr that command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala otherwise we could fall prey and be victimized following those Imams who could lead us towards the fire of hell in the light of the verses of Holy Quran so as a believer it is our duty to seek guidance from those whom Allah has appointed and if we are following those whom Allah has appointed, then we are on the path of sirat mustaqim But if we decide to choose Imam by our own taste, by our own conditions, uh, favoring our own tribe, favoring our own clan, favoring our own language, or any other basis, that Imam is not going to be acceptable because he might end up taking us towards the fire of hell. Please say the salawat. Now this question was asked to the Imam in regards to this verse of Holy Quran. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَحْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we appoint the Imams or we are the ones 
who make the imams and they guide by our command, O oh, grandson of the Holy Prophet, tell us what is meant, who are the mizdaq, who are those people whom Allah has appointed. So the imam says, Khala nazalat fi wulde Fatima. This verse was revealed for the children of Fatima. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And another narration on the same lines says that Qala nazalat fi wulde Fatima khasatan ja'ala Allahu minhum a'immatan yahduna bi'amrihi. The Imam says that this verse was revealed to show that the children of Fatima are the, those Imams whom Allah appoints. And they are the ones who guide people by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, especially uh, through his command. So when we look into the light of ahadith, we have clear ahadith that are stating that the divine guidance that comes to mankind through the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can come through that divine channel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened up for mankind through his last messenger Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Another place I saw in reference to this verse, another riwayah, uh, which is quite interesting. It has social implications uh, in pretty much every aspect of our life. So I thought I would like to share with uh, you all this also, in which the narration says that the Imam, our first Imam, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu was salam, when he was married to Hazrat Zahra salam alayhi alayha, and the next day the Prophet walks to the door of the first Imam, walks to the door of Imam Ali, knocks the door, the Imam opens up the door, and it's the first day after the marriage of Imam Ali and Hazrat Fatima, and the, the Prophet of Allah asks, Amir al Mu'mineen. Fasa'ala Ali and Kaifa Vajatta Ahlak. The Prophet of Allah asked Imam Ali, How did you find your spouse? How did you find my daughter Fatima for you? And the Imam is responding. Imam Ali is responding. Khala ni'mal awnu ala ta'atillah. A best helper and a companion in obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how Imam Ali finds his spouse and this is what Imam Ali is telling Prophet of Allah that my wife is the best source, a best helper in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Prophet of Allah goes and asks Hazrat Fatima salam Allah alayha wa sa'ala Fatima khalat khayru ba'lin when the Prophet asked Hazrat Fatima, she also replies, a best husband. So the relationship, the marriage is being started and you find that marriage is becoming a means of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a marriage of a believer. My dear brothers and sisters, we need to ponder, especially my young brothers and sisters, uh, when they are looking up for spouses, uh, your spouse should be a source of you becoming a better Muslim, a better mu'min, getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your spouse cannot be a source of corruption for you. Your spouse cannot be a source of correct, corrupting your iman, corrupting your Islam. We have to seek spouses who are going to be a source of enhancing our iman, not corrupting our iman. And for that, the criteria with which we should be looking at our spouses should be Iman and Taqwa. Not the color of the skin or how beautiful with whatever standard we try to judge other people. That should not be the criteria. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. When the Prophet hears this, if a marriage is founded 
on a principle of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can it go wrong? But if the marriage is based on promises that I was told I'm going to have a five bedroom house and still we are living in a two bedroom apartment. If marriage is founded on basis like this, do you think that marriage is going to last? But the marriage that is founded on making each other better Muslims, better believers, it is going to last longer because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's special grace and his special mercy would be along with it. And that is the seerah and that is the path of Rasulullah and his holy progeny, which is shown in this, uh, in this uh, rivayah. And then the Prophet of Allah raises his hand and then starts uh, praying and uh, making dua for uh, both Imam Ali and Hazrat Fatima by saying, Allahumma, aj Allahumma jma sham lahuma wa alif bayna khulubihima wa jalhuma wa zurriyatahuma min warasate jannatin naim. The Prophet starts raising his hand and praying, O oh Allah, make them they increase their love, multiply their love, and make them and their progeny inheritors of the blessed paradise this is what uh, the prophet of allah is making dua and then warzukhuma zurriyatan tahiratan tayyibatan mubaraka oh allah grant them a progeny which is pure and which is free from defects and sins of any sort and who are the blessed progeny and bless their progeny and make them the imams who would guide through your command the same verse of Holy Quran that I had mentioned, the same phrase the Prophet of Allah is mentioning. Ila ta'ateka. Make them Imam such that who would guide other people through your command towards your obedience. Wa ya amuruna bima yurzika. And then command them of what pleases you. My dear brothers and sisters, here in the riwayat, when we look at the riwayat, the Prophet of Allah is making the dua that the progeny of Fatima and Ali be those Imams who are guiding humanity by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We see the other narrations in which the Imams are mentioning that this is for the children of Fatima. See, we are not saying the children of Ali. We are saying children of Fatima because the children of Fatima, Hassan and Hussein, are the children of Fatima, but the Prophet of Allah had said, they are my sons. Hassan and Hussein, they are my sons. In fact, the Prophet of Allah says, and this is a narration which is accepted by all schools of thought, which says that Hassan and Hussein, they are imaman, they are imam, they are whether they are sitting or whether they are standing. So the Prophet of Allah is praying, and do you think that the dua that the Prophet of Allah makes for Hassan and Hussein to be the progeny of Fatima, to be those Imams whom Allah is going to appoint for the guidance of people who are going to guide people through the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if that is the dua of the Holy Prophet, it would not come true. Of course, it came true. And Hassan and Hussein were the proven Imams who had guided mankind towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Praise <clears throat> Allah. Now what is that Amr? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yahduna bi Amrina. When we look into the verses of the Holy Quran, in Surah Yasin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ma amruhu iza arada shay'an an yaqula lahu kun fayakun. His Amr, his command, the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is it? When he wills something, all he has to say is, be it, and it is. That is Amr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is what Yahduna bi Amrina means. Or if you look at other uh, surah, Surah Khamar, verse 50, وَمَا أَمْرُنَا إِلَّا وَاحِدَةٌ كَلَمْحٍ بِالْبَسَرِ 
and our command is but a single word like the twinkling of an eye. So the Imams who are appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they come with that divine Amr, which is on the station of Kun Fayakun. They would say something to be and it is. That is how the Imams are appointed. Imams do not come with, you know, helpless, not knowing what to do, wandering, assuming, and then uh, not knowing, and then regretting. No, Imam comes with a clear way. And it is absolutely necessary if the path has difficulties, and if the path is rugged, if the path is dangerous, then the guide has to be very, very precise and very, very attentive and very, very sure of where he is leading other people. My brother lives in Middle East and they have a desert safari there. Some of you who might have visited Middle East might have seen. In a desert safari, there are, you know, trailer of cars that follow each other, SUVs, inside the desert. And when they are going inside the desert, the, the, the road, or there's no road, it's all desert. The track or the path is very, very unpredictable. And every time I have been there, I have seen it was completely different. And they say the desert changes its position in the night. So when the wind blows, the sand starts making sand dunes in different positions. So next day they come in, there is a new challenge in the same place. And the cars go up and down and, and the terrain is so tough and so difficult. And I was asking, you know, uh, my brother, uh, you are behind. Why don't you go in the front? He said, the guy who is in the front, you know how experienced he is? Because if he trips, all these cars are going to trip behind him. He is the best driver that this area could afford to have. And he knows the terrain like he has lived, he lives there and he grew up in the desert. He knows the desert very well. And he has to know that to ensure that he could take this whole trailer of cars. Or for that matter, let us take an example of uh, uh, trekking Himalayas. If you want to go to Himalayas, people go from here trekking Mount Everest. And you know that, you know, to go to Mount Everest, you need to be really, really um, very tough. A uh, lot of endurance, a lot of stamina, a lot of strength, a lot of willpower, and a um, lot of good health, a lot of muscle, body mass, all those things that are absolutely necessary for you to survive. But having all that, a lot of equipment, but with all that, you cannot trek Mount Everest. You need to have a Sherpa. You know what a Sherpa is? Sherpa is a, you know, short-heighted uh, Nepalese guy from Nepal uh, who grew up in Mount Everest and around that area. This guy has never been to university, never seen anything, but he knows Mount Everest very, very well. He might have trekked Mount Everest 20 times. He knows every corner, every edge where the dangers are and he can operate without any electronic equipment he could see the sky and would say whether there is a snowstorm that is going to come he could hear the voice of the birds and he would say how things are going to suddenly change while they are trekking and those moments are very very important and that guide is absolutely necessary for those who are trying to trek mount everest so my dear brothers and sisters a leader, the one who is going to lead, has to know what are the challenges that he is going to confront. And he needs to not only know, he needs to overcome those challenges, not for only himself, but also for those who are following him. 
Therefore, it is necessary that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appoints a guide for mankind who would not be deviated by the insinuations of shaitan while shaitan is trying to distract mankind. Therefore, Allah appoints an imam who is divinely appointed with the amr, with the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Recite as loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So the logical explanation is that if you want to trek Mount Everest, you need a Sherpa. If you make, if you don't make that choice, you say, oh no, we are very, very strong. We are very, very well trained. We are going to go on our own. That is not going to help. And if you make that mistake, the consequences could be very, very serious. And so it is in our spiritual realm, in our spiritual world. If we do not follow the Imam who had been appointed by Allah, who has the patience that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testifies his patience, who has the conviction and the belief and the yaqeen and the certitude that is testified by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then and only then we will be guided towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, shaitan has said, certainly, certainly, I am going to deviate mankind from your path, except for those who are already guided, whether we call those who are guided in Surah Fatiha or another, other verses of the Holy Quran, shaitan also makes an exception that they are some Illiyin that he does not extend or his influence cannot be extended upon them and those are the personalities that we will we have to follow and they are the children of Fatima, Imam Hassan and him, Imam Hussein and their progeny. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now Hazrat Ibrahim, we all know that Quran declares that Hazrat Ibrahim was made Imam. But before that, see what Surah Anam, verse 75 says, كَذَلِكَ نُرِي إِبْرَاهِيمَ مَلَكُوتَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْعَرْضِ وَلَيَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْقِنِينَ Thus, we, did we show Abraham the dominions of the heavens and the earth that he might be of those who possess certitude. So Hazrat Ibrahim is first being trained and he is being brought up to speed directly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that we are the ones who have shown Abraham this world and the heavens so that he can attain certitude. He can attain yaqeen which is the condition for being imam. That is the condition like uh, the words that I had yahduna bi amrena lamma sabaru and uh, they are the ones who have convictions in our signs, who have certitude, who have yaqeen. And here Quran says that we have first shown Abraham the dominions of heavens and the earth so that Abraham could be amongst those who have certitude and yaqeen. And after that, after that level is passed, then Abraham is tested. And Quran says, وَإِذِبْتَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتٍ فَأَتَمَّهُنَّ And then we tested Abraham. We gave an exam to Abraham. And Abraham came out successful in that exam that Allah had tested Abraham, then the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qala inni ja'iluka linnaasa imama. Allah says, then Allah says to Abraham, O oh Abraham, I am now making you the imam of the people. So the station of imama, the station of leadership that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even when somebody is a prophet, he is not an imam. Yahduna be amrena to get to attain that level, he has to see the dominions of heavens and the earth to attain that certitude, to have that yaqeen before he is appointed as an imam. And when he attains that certitude, there are other instances where Abraham uh, says to Allah, Oh Allah, show me why do you uh, bring about, uh, why do you. Uh, how do you raise the dead? Show me how you raise the dead. Verses of Holy Quran. 
Allah says, Abraham, what are you talking about? Don't you have yaqeen? Don't you have conviction that we are going to raise those who would pass away? What does Abraham say? Oh Allah, for the satisfaction of my soul. Oh Allah, for the itminan of my khalb. Make me, show me how you are going to raise the dead. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows Abraham, commands Abraham that he brings four birds and then they are grounded and then their meat is mixed with each other and then Allah says, put them on the tops of mountains, four mountains and then, O Abraham, call them. And the moment Abraham calls them, they start flying towards hazrat Ibrahim. They start flying towards Abraham. This is how Allah raises the dead. But this is also showing that Abraham did not have that itmanan khalb, that servitude, that certitude and that conviction before he was made an imam. When he attained that station, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O Abraham, I am making you the imam. So imama, divine guidance, my dear brothers and sisters, comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is only given to those who have patience and who have certitude. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. This is a narration from uh, the book of our brothers of Ahl Sunnah and the narrator is Ibn Shazan. Um, who narrates from Ibn Abbas that the Prophet of Allah called upon people, Mashir an Nas, I'lamu, O people, know, Inna lillahi ta'ala baban, for Allah, there is a door, there is a pathway to enter towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Man dakhalahu amena min al fazail akbar, whoever enters through it, would be secured and would be protected from that great terror. That's the day of judgment. So, when the Prophet of Allah declares this, فَخَالَ لَهُ أَبُو سَعِيد الْخُزْرِ A companion of the Holy Prophet responds and says, Ya Rasulullah, اِحْدِنَا إِلَى حَازَ الْبَابِ O Prophet of Allah, guide us towards this door through which if we would enter towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we would be protected from the great terror that's going to be caused on the day of judgment. Hatta na'arifahu, so that we know who this door is. Fakhala, then the Prophet of Allah says, Huwa Ali ibn Abi Talib, Sayyidul Wasi'een, wa Amir al-Mu'mineen, wa Akhu Rasul Rabbil Alameen, wa Khalifatullahi ala nasi ajma'een. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali. The Prophet of Allah says that, that is Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and then he is describing the attributes of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He is the wasi. He is the inheritor of, he is the executor of the will of Rasulullah. He is the master and the leader of the believers. And he is the brother of the believers. So my dear brothers and sisters, the door that would take us towards safety from that great calamity that is bound to occur on the day of judgment is Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now let us, uh, today happens to be um, 17th Safar also uh, is considered to be the uh, martyrdom of our 8th Imam, Imam Raza alayhi salam. So I wanted to uh, talk about him also a little bit and I would like to start with the, the, the narration which is called um, Silsilatul Zahab. This narration which is the golden tradition in which when the Imam comes from Medina and he is going uh, towards, he leaves Neshapur and he is going towards Mamun, towards Marv. The narrators of Ahadith, the narration says more than 20,000 narrators of Ahadith uh, come around the Imam while the Imam is sitting on the camel about to leave saying, O grandson of the Holy Prophet, 
please give us a hadith of Rasulullah so that we can note it directly and we want the golden chain going all the way from you to Rasulullah. And then the, uh, the Imam says, uh, then the Imam narrates this hadith in which he says that I have heard from my father and he from uh, his father all the way to Amirul Mu'mineen and then to Rasulullah and then from Rasulullah to Jibra'il to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says La ilaha illallah hisni Kalamai la ilaha illallah or la ilaha illallah the phrase la ilaha illallah there is no God but Allah is my fort is my his my fort Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that La ilaha illallah is my fort. And then, فَمَنْ دَخَلَ hisni amena min azabi. Whoever enters into this fort of La ilaha illallah, he would be protected from my chastisement, from my azab. And then, فَلَمَّا مَرَّتِ rahila And then the uh, the camel started moving forward and then the imam was moving but and then the imam says nadana bi shurutiha wa ana min shurutiha imam says that la ilaha illallah is the fort whoever enters the fort of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be protected from the chastisement and the punishment of allah but with conditions and I am one of those conditions. That is the Imam himself. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. There are many uh, narrations about how Imam had shown if there was a divine intervention that needed to take place to create that certitude, that yaqeen in the hearts of people, the Imam was kind enough to show people that he knows things and there is a narration in which um, a person leaves uh, his own town uh, and come towards the imam and uh, his daughter she gives him a piece of cloth and she says you are going towards Nishapur when you go there sell this piece of cloth that I am giving you O oh father and then buy me a feroza, a stone that uh, is very popular of Neshapur. So this person says that uh, I took my uh, belongings and he was a businessman so he had a lot of things to sell. I came into the city and after a few days passed by uh, a person, uh, a group of people come and they arrive and they say we want to buy clothes from you because there's a scholar who had passed away and we have to do the burial arrangements and uh, we believe you have a, that uh, cloth that we would like to buy. He says, no, I'm not sending any clothes. I, I, I don't have any cloth with me. So they return. They were sent by our eighth Imam, Imam Raza. So they were sent back. Then the Imam sends them again. He says, I do not have any cloth. Then the, these people say that Imam Raza had said that your daughter had sent a piece of cloth for you to sell and to bring her Feroza for her. And that's when he is reminded through the knowledge of the Imam. And then he says, well, I did give him the cloth, but I also had a couple of questions about this Imam. How are things, you know, uh, I need to clarify with or, with, before I could actually accept him to be my Imam. So I wrote a list of questions that I wanted the Imam to answer for me. And I took this question so I could meet the Imam. And I waited and I waited and I saw that there is no way I could reach because of the, the rush of people who were approaching the Imam and talking to the Imam. And there was no way for me to reach uh, and I was disappointed and I was returning. Just then a person taps my shoulder and tells me that the questions you had. This is the answer and he returns a piece of paper saying the Imam has written the answers for the questions that you had. The paper was not even given to the Imam and the Imam is responding to this person. Please say the salawat. Another narration talks about how this person sees the Prophet of Allah in his dream 
and then the prophet is in the masjid of his town and the prophet is sitting on a specific carpet in the masjid and he has a tray of dates right next to him and when this person approaches the prophet, the prophet gives him a bunch of dates and he says, I counted the dates in the dream that I had and I saw there were 18 dates. And then I woke up from the dream and I thought that the Prophet of Allah has given me 18 dates and it means probably I'm going to live for another 18 years. That's what it means. And not long uh, ago, uh, I heard that Imam Raza has arrived into my city, into my town. So I go to the masjid and I find he is sitting exactly the way the Prophet of Allah was sitting. And on the same carpet that I had seen the Prophet of Allah sitting in my dream, and with a similar tray filled with dates, the Imam was sitting. And when I approached the Imam, I gave my salams to the Imam. The Imam gave me a bunch of dates. And then I start counting them. And I count them and the dates are about 18. So he says, uh, the narrator says, I told the Imam, Imam, these are 18 dates only. Can I have some more? So the Imam says, if my grandfather would have given you more in your dream, I would have given you more too. So the Imam would show to those, my dear brothers and sisters, who are seeking guidance from him. But we are the ones who need to seek guidance. These Imams have been sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our own guidance. And they had to endure the calamities of the oppression and the zulm only so that we can get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can be steadfast on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that was the reason those tyrants of the time were threatened even when the imams were sitting on the sidelines. Why? Because they knew that although they are on the sidelines, they have influence amongst the people because they rule upon the hearts of the people. And therefore, they always conspired to kill them, to assassinate them. And that was the case even with uh, the eighth Imam. And that's how the Imam was given poison. And who gave the poison? Mamun Rashid. Mamun Rashid was the Khalifa of Abbasi, whose father was Harun Rashid. Harun Rashid had two sons, Mamun and Amin. And Amin was the son of an Arab wife. And Mamun was the son of an Iranian wife. And there was a conflict. And both of them wanted to be the Khulafas. And Harun had promised the Iranian side of his Khilafa to Mamun. And the Arab side of his Khilafa to Amin. But when Harun died, Amin declined from giving that and Mamun killed Amin to attain the Khilafah. He killed his own brother to attain the Khilafah. But Mamun was, uh, acted as if he is very, very pious and he tried to project himself that he wanted to establish justice. But he could not do so because he had killed his own brother. And now he saw that there was dissension and there was revolt with the those who were following or who were Alawis who were following the Ahl al-Bayt. And they were all rounding around the grandson of the Holy Prophet Imam Raza alayhi salam. And therefore Mamun just to attain and acquire the support of the followers of the Imam forced Imam into coming and becoming his successor. And that was the purpose. Uh, the discussion is quite uh, lengthy. I would not go there. But when he prevailed over the situation and he wanted to get the support of the uh, Arab side the, uh, of the Abbasis, uh, he had to eliminate the Imam. And historical proofs show that Mamun, after killing the Imam, writes letter to the Abbasis in Baghdad, telling them that Imam Raza is out of the way and I am the son of Harun Rashid and you have to accept my leadership. 
So there was no sincere intention of Mamun any time to make Imam his successor. It was only a tactic to prevail and get the support and ensure that the Imam is isolated so that people cannot interact with him. He could keep uh, him under his watch so that people would not surround him, him, surround him or support him. And when the time came, he did administer a poison to the imam. There are two narrations. One says that he was poisoned by the, uh, the juice of a pomegranate and uh, that Mamun himself gave to the imam. The other uh, is that he was poisoned by the grapes which were already poisoned. And when the imam got up to leave, Mamun asked imam, where are you going, O grandson of the holy prophet? He says, I am going where you wanted to send me. And then the Imam leaves, comes back to his home and he passes away in two days. My dear brothers and sisters, all of our Imams, the similarity of this Imam with Imam Sajjad is such that when the seventh Imam was martyred and his body was lying in Baghdad upon a bridge and there was nobody to take care of his body to give the funeral just as Imam Sajjad came back to Karbala after being imprisoned and was being dragged by the Bani Umayyah towards Kufa, Imam Sajjad came and gave the burial to Imam Hussain. That is how Imam Raza came to Baghdad and gave the burial to his father, Imam Qazim. But when this Imam passed away, my dear brothers and sisters, Mamun made a big deal out of it and he made the whole nation mourn the death of the Imam and he made sure that the grave of the Imam is uh, near his father Harun Rashid. So he was making a public display of mourning for the Imam and he was very respectfully uh, given the burial. I would say to this Imam that, O oh, Imam, you had been given that respect while you were alive, although it might have been hypocritical of Mamun, but there were millions of people who followed you, and that was what was Mamun fearful of. And when you passed away, and even today, your shrine is filled with pilgrims and followers. But, O oh, Imam, you are Jad Imam Hussain. When he was brought into Karbala with a handful of companions on one side, the family of Rasulullah having 72 companions, whereas Umar ibn Sa'd and his army was ranging from 5,000 to 25,000, your grandfather Hussein was martyred mercilessly in the hands of, uh, in the plains of Karbala while the Imam was thirsty and the Imam was hungry. The children of the Imam were thirsty but the enemies of Islam did not uh, satisfy their enmity and their despise against Ahl al-Bayt and the family of Rasulullah. They made sure that even after the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, not only the Imam's body was trampled under the hoofs of the horses but the, the tents were put to fire and the Ahl al-Bayt were dragged as prisoners into the the streets of Kufa and Sham. Sayalamun lazina zalamu ayyamun falabi yan salibu. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. O Allah, we ask you upon this great tragedy of the family of Rasulullah that inspire us and give us the tawfiq so that we could truly follow the path of Imam Hussein and his followers. O Allah, protect life, property, dignity, and honor of believers wherever they are. O Allah, if the enemies of Islam have the potential and the capacity to change, change them, otherwise destroy them in front of our eyes. O Allah, hasten the reappearance of the Imam of our time and make us such that the Imam of our time would be pleased with us. O oh Allah, cure those who are sick in our community. Forgive those who have passed away from our community. And O oh Allah, if you have forgiven them, mahshur them will Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wasalam. 
Please recite the Surah Fatiha for the souls of Marhumin, of all those who are attending tonight's program, and especially of the sponsors of tonight's program.